today. We've got brand new research, everybody. Yes. And we are going to introduce you to very simple behavior changes that you can institute immediately that will improve your life. Yeah. All grounded by research. Mm -hmm. And some of them, quite shockingly, weird and surprising. Yes. And these are all brand new, just released, amazing, legit studies. So we're super excited to share them. Okay. What is the first change we need to make. Definitely. So there was recently a huge brand new study from researchers at the University of Texas at Austin, New Chicago, all about the power of random acts of kindness. And this study is called A Little Good Goes an Unexpectedly Long Way, Underestimating the Positive Impact of Kindness on Recipients. Okay, but we all know that acts of kindness are things that make us feel good. But why is this brand new research something we have to pay attention to? So like in the year ahead, acts of kindness people all day long. How come we have to pay attention to this? Definitely. So what the researchers really looked into is why do we not do random acts of kindness? Because what they found is they're actually pretty uncommon. We think that, oh, we just do this. We all know what to do. We don't. Most people do not do random acts of kindness. And it's because we actually don't think it's going to matter to other people. Oh, yeah. And what the researchers found is it does. No matter how tiny, a random act of kindness makes a massive difference for someone else. And you are happier as a result of doing it. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So we know that we should be doing this. But what you're saying is that we don't do this. And this is where the insight comes in. Yes. Is that we assume it's not going to matter. Exactly. And... A random act of kindness, it's like the littlest thing. Yeah. Smiling at somebody, mm -hmm. putting your arm around somebody, waving yeah. somebody into traffic. Yeah. Um, you know, even tipping yes. somebody that's Huge making one. your coffee and looking at them and saying thank you. Mm -hmm. These are all small things that make a difference. And we think it doesn't make a difference. And so I think that's where the learning is, at least for me. Yeah, definitely. Is that you're not doing it not because you don't think it, it it's an important thing to do. You're not doing it because you don't think it matters. Yes, exactly. And the New York Times picked up this brand new study, ran a huge article on it, and there were thousands of comments of people sharing their stories of random acts of kindness. And it's a reminder that these do matter to people. And here's the interesting twist about the story. And it's why Tracy was so excited to talk about this particular piece of research. The stories were not from people who were like, oh, I started to pay a for it forward chain. No. Which, by the way, you know how everybody starts doing the pay it forward chains yeah. typically around the holidays where you're going to buy the coffee for the person behind mm -hmm. you? I saw this interesting post by somebody who used to be a barista who says that is a complete nightmare for operations because it gets confusing whose drink is whose and what got paid for and people don't know how to grab the drink. Mm -hmm. And that if you wanna do something nice in a super busy coffee shop, look at the person making the coffee, mm -hmm. tell them thank you and how much you appreciate them and give that minimum wage person yeah. a tip that is the cost of a cup of coffee that you would have bought for the stranger mm -hmm. behind you. Uh, which I thought was really interesting, but, yeah. but this piece of research, which really, impacted me is all of the comments were not about people bragging yeah. about their acts of kindness. It was people sharing stories yeah. about how an act of kindness from a stranger or a teacher or somebody in their life yeah. changed the trajectory of their life. Their entire life. Yeah. Why don't you read that one comment that had us all just get goosebumps? Yeah, definitely. So this is a comment that was within the article. The comment said, as a child, I lived in absolute poverty with an abusive parent. I had a music teacher who one day stopped me while walking down the hall and simply said, are you okay? I broke down. He took me to his office, fed me his lunch and allowed me the space to pull myself together. He told me you're in a bad spot, but it doesn't have to be your life. That small gesture gave me the hope to believe in myself and allowed me to start considering a future where the cycle of abuse and poverty don't exist. 30 years later, he was right and the cycles have been broken. That small moment changed my life, it changed my partner's life, and it changed my children's lives. I want you to take a minute 
And I want you to think about a moment, yeah, an act of kindness that somebody else did for you that was meaningful. And when you think about it from being on the recipient's end, from you being the one, even if it's just as simple as like you were running super late for something and traffic was monstrous and a stranger waved you in with yeah. a smile, how that makes your energy shift. Mm -hmm. That's what I want you to think about when it comes to this brand new research. Yeah. Please act of kindness, all of us start incorporating it into our day-to-day -day lives. All right, what's next? <laughs> okay, great. So this second piece of research is very exciting as we think about the new year is coming, a lot of us want new fitness routines, but it always seems to be easier to talk about creating that new routine mm -hmm. than actually implementing it, Okay, especially when you're busy like you and I both are. This is a brand new study that is called Less Gym Time, Same Results. I'm down. Less gym time, same results. Let's go, people. Brand what do we do? new big study from researchers at Edith Cowan University in Australia, along with whole research teams in Japan and Brazil. Listen to this. All you need to do to build your strength is do what's called the eccentric muscle contraction, a.k.a. the second half of any exercise. Okay, I don't know what so, you're talking about. Imagine that you were standing up uh -huh. to sit down in your chair or to squat. Okay. It's simply the motion of the sitting down part, not the standing up. Okay, so let me see if I'm getting this right. So are you basically saying that so many of us are losing the benefit of certain things we do all day long? Like for me, plopping into a chair. Yes. I it, let gravity do the work. I it, do not consider sitting in a chair exercise. Are you telling me that this study says that I can consciously sit in a chair differently and I will be exercising? Yes. It says that one muscle contraction in this downward movement for just three seconds a day can increase muscle strength if you do it each day. <laughs> what? Well, okay, so you're not even necessarily talking about how, like, if you're doing bicep curls, you know how people are like, you got to slow down and not just flump the, the weight down. And that down. is true. And that in the research, they did use bicep curls to say people who just did the downward and then put their weights down and then maybe they just got them back up, but it wasn't part of the motion. Yep. Yes. In exercise, they're saying you can cut your routine in half by just doing the second half of each exercise but you can apply this in your life Wow! for passive exercise. Okay, I'm down with passive exercise. I remember when my mom found this revolutionary way of exercising where you literally lay on a table and they <laughs> strap your feet into things and they lift your legs for you. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's not exercise, but if it works for you and it gets you there, great. But so I'm gonna unpack this because there's two benefits yeah. to this. Passive exercise, everybody. What was the fancy word? Eccentric. Eccentric. So. When I, it's true, when I do strength training, I focus on lifting up the weight. I don't get intentional about resisting it dropping down. And the lifting up doesn't seem to matter that much, according to the research. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Now let's do the chair thing. So I want to try this. So I'm standing up. Okay. <clears throat> and normally, when I go to sit down, I just like plop down. Yeah. You just went right into yeah, the chair gravity right now. did the work yeah and the chair took the beating yes, yes. okay so now i'm going to stand up and i'm going to you are slowly slowly oh slowly okay, like slowly 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 going oh down okay now my shins are engaged. great and now i'm holding you're holding down for one so i don't leave three don't and leave. also this is like an ab exercise my butt is like an inch above the chair and this is like a squat if you oh the research is saying if you can once per day for three seconds slowly chair sit you have just exercised building your muscles i'm doing this could be easier than a whole weight training new year's resolution my life has just been changed by passive exercise research ladies and gentlemen tracy genius <laughs> thank you so we've got acts of kindness remembering how profound they are for somebody yes. even just a smile oh you know one act of kindness yeah that i do all the time whenever i see somebody that has their nails done, mm -hmm. particularly like the tips and the cool stuff and the yeah. designs, I always compliment them. 
And the reason why is I know that they took the time mm-hmm. to do it. And try this. Compliment somebody's nails. You will see somebody light up like a Christmas tree when you compliment their nails. They feel seen. They feel acknowledged. Mm-hmm. It's a simple way to do it. Okay. Okay. What do you think of my sparkly nails? Oh, <laughs> Tracy, with the gold. You are not a nail polish person either. No, I'm so. not. Well, show them to the, to the YouTube community. It's gold, everybody. For okay. Christmas. All right, next study. So this study, when I first read it, I was a little bit floored by it. So this floored is a, in the, this is stupid or floored. Because there's a some, mix. There's it, some it felt research stupid, we find. And I cannot believe how big of an impact and how big this study is for what it is, but I think this is a very simple thing that anyone can do for one second each day. Wait, one second? One second. Well, you know, I think five seconds can change somebody. Five you are seconds. taking it down, Tracy. This one thing is going to give you an improvement in mental well being for eight hours. And it works in healthy people, it works in those with depression, it works in those with all different kinds of mental health challenges. Here is the study. This was a huge study in the UK at King's College London, huge, reputable research university that was published in scientific reports. Can I just stop you? Yeah. Because I'm trying to think of what this is. Okay. (laughs) I don't think you're going to get it right. Orgasm? No. (laughs) No? Okay. No. I can't think of anything else. So this study took place across a four-year span. They collected data of 20,000 assessments, and they had global participants in the study. And do you know what they found, Mel? That would improve my life for eight hours after just doing this for one second. No. The study is called Feeling Chirpy. So in this study, what's really interesting, too, is you might think, okay, you're out in nature. That's the benefit. But no. They isolated. It is not about trees. It is not about plants. It is not about being by the water. It works if you listen on an app. Really? There is something about the sound of birds. You can go on YouTube. You can listen to a bird song app. You could get outside. But that deeply resonates with us, even at a subconscious level, for eight hours of improved mental well-being up to up to eight hours. That's incredible. You know, it reminds me... Um, up here in uh, Vermont, when my in-laws owned this house, there was a clock that used to hang in the kitchen. And every single hour was the photo of a different bird. Mm-hmm. And when the clock would hit the hour, the chirping of the bird would happen. And it didn't matter how many people were in the kitchen. Everybody would stop and turn toward the clock. Mm-hmm. And so on some level, this seems like one of those studies where you're like, honestly, who the hell even got this idea? This? This? <laughs> you know, like, but if they've got more than 26,000 assessments. Mm-hmm. Over they, four years. Over four years, there's something here. And I just, I just wonder because I wonder if this has to do with evolution and the fact wow. that if you think about our ancestors truly navigating and migrating and following patterns of nature and wind and stars and the migratory patterns of birds. Yeah. That I wonder if there is this connection. And, you know, I I agree. I I I love the sound of birds. Except for a crow. I don't like a crow. But (laughs) if I if I hear a songbird chirping, yeah. It does cause a lift in mood. Yeah. That's incredible. Wow. So now I'm sitting down mindfully. I'm listening for birds. Yeah. Just to put it on YouTube after your episode of the Mel Robbins podcast. Maybe we should just play some birds right now. Let's play the bird sound. Okay. Great. What else you got for us? Well, now that we're so grounded after our bird sound, there is a huge brand new, like just published study from Georgetown Medical Center published in the JAMA Psychiatry Journal, which is a really big prestigious journal. So this research is legit. My dad used to get that. The journal, I think it's of American Medical Association. Probably. I can't believe that. So this is legit. They compared in people who have anxiety, taking Lexapro versus doing mindfulness-based stress reduction, which often looks like a body scan or gratitude journaling. Now, by body scan, you don't mean climbing into an MRI. No, I mean, how is my body feeling right now? So a lot of times in yoga, 
Um, they'll use this relaxation technique mm-hmm. in a class where yeah. you're like, you know, scrunch up your feet, relax them, scrunch your ankles, relax yes. them, you know, like uh, flex your quads, relax them. That's sort of a way to kind of body yes. scan. So that's one example. What's another example they use? Gratitude journaling. Really? Yes. That's a powerful example of mindfulness-based stress reduction. Okay. So they studied Lexapro. Yes. And then they also studied these mindfulness techniques that bring you into your body and into the moment. Yes. And there are a number of them, but those are just two to highlight. It's the yep. gratitude journaling. And what they found is the drop in anxiety was equal between Lexapro and just doing these deliberate mindfulness-based stress reduction practices like a gratitude journal. Wow. Yeah. I think I have a hunch for why that why? might be. Well, because as somebody who has dealt with and felt anxiety yeah. for almost my entire life, I mean, I have it under control now and I profoundly understand it. So yeah. I'm, I, I'm annoyed by it, but I'm not scared by it anymore. Um, what's interesting is that anxiety, as we know, is an alarm. Mm -hmm. And anxiety is signaling that something's up and you need some reassurance. And anxiety also typically takes you immediately into the future that something bad's about to happen. If you're having, if you're directing your mind to pick up a pen and to start writing what you're grateful for, you're activating a part of your mind that's different from the part of the mind that takes over when you're anxious. Mm Mm-hmm. And so it's a way for you to almost like shortcut yeah. in your own mind yeah. this this skill of pulling yourself into the present moment. And if you are having a panic attack or you're anxious, you're not in the present moment. Exactly. And so this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, definitely. And the research, you know, still emphasizes that there's a need for medication and for practices, but in conjunction can have a really, really powerful effect, especially in how your brain actually changes what areas are active. Well, and the other thing that I've found personally and that we know based on the research is that the more that you practice these strategies, whether it's uh, doing a body scan of your own body in the moment, whether it's gratitude journaling, whether it's certain forms of breathing, yeah. Whether it is um, redirecting your thoughts. Uh, the other exercise we talk about a lot is the five senses, where in a moment where you feel anxious, you say, well, what can I smell right now? Yeah. What do I see in front of me? And by describing those five senses, again, you are interrupting that part of the brain from taking yeah. over, signaled by the alarm, and you pull yourself into the present. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, definitely. But it's I awesome. love knowing. Why do I love knowing? that researchers at Yale have confirmed that. Because a lot of this is common sense. A lot of it is common sense, but I think there's something about knowing your time spent in your gratitude journal is worth it. That it matters. It matters. It really does. Yeah. All right. What else you got for us? This is really cool. Great. So we've done the act of kindness. Yeah. You've sat in your chair very, 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 very slowly. You have listened to your bird sound. Now we have written down what gratitude have gratitude about. This next one is super interesting, and it is about willpower. Mm. So a big study from UPenn in Michigan looked at 20,000 high schoolers as they studied for and took the SAT exam. Okay. What they found, taking into account socioeconomic status, all of their prior achievements throughout high school even, what matters the most for their study plan and their scores is if they didn't rely on willpower— and set themselves up with strategies to better be able to study. So you're saying, if the students didn't do what I did, or didn't do what I see my kids doing, which is basically, you got the laptop open, you got the phone on, you got piles of books all around you, and you're just going to try to plow through it. Yes. If instead, you get deliberate about chunking it out, putting the phone to the side, having deliberate blocks of time to study that Mm -hmm. you're going to do better on the test? Yeah. In particular, the ones they mentioned was disabling your cell phone. Okay. So turn the phone off. If you're serious about performing better. Yes. You got to turn the phone off when you're preparing. Okay. That's number one. Setting up a distraction-free place to get your work done. Setting up a distraction-free place. I'm I'm starting to smile, Trace, because yesterday, Tracy and I... (laughs) We're 
going over the final draft to our newsletter that goes out twice a week. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Just go to melrobbins.com to sign up for it. And Tracy was trying to get me to focus. Mel was doing some online shopping That's while right. <laughs> writing the newsletter to you guys. Two tabs open. And so Tracy was so awesome. She, without skipping a beat, you didn't even look at me. You just reached your hand over and shut the the laptop and then shoved it away from me. I you did. You did what the study is telling. And do you yeah. know how quickly we wrapped up the final event? Yeah, we focused right in and an awesome newsletter went out. Totally. Yeah. And then the other strategy as well, in addition to distraction free and disabling your cell phone, is creating a schedule to study. So take a look at the week if you've yeah. got a big project or you got something and schedule in blocks of time where you're going to go to that distraction free thing and you're going to turn off your cell phone. And that if you were to do that, did they find anything about how it also took less time? Or just that you were more effective, whatever time more you effective. put in. Yes. And one thing they found that did not work was when people said that they willed themselves to study. Mm. Willpower did not lead to results because willpower fades. We can't rely on willpower. And while this is about the SAT, you could probably generalize these results for anything where high performance or studying or preparation is needed. So are you suggesting that sitting on the couch with Netflix on and my laptop open <laughs> yes. is not a good way to research podcast episodes. Probably, depending on how long you want it to take, if you want to study more efficiently, faster, and just perform better, yeah. Put your phone on Do Not Disturb. Go into your other room. Shut the laptop. Shut the laptop. And also look at your calendar in the morning and say, what am I going to get done today? Awesome. Simple strategies lead to a huge result. And again, like I think that these are the things that in the back of your mind... We kind of go, duh. Yeah. But having these validated studies, 20,000 high school students, yeah. like why wouldn't you do this unless you just want to shoot yourself in the foot and make life harder? Yeah. Okay, cool. What else you got? Great. So now we have number six. This is a really interesting study that once you hear it, you're going to resonate with this in your own life. And it's about smell and food, recalling a memory instantly when you smell something that brings you back to an old time and place. Okay. So this is a study out of Lancaster University in the UK, brand new study, where they actually asked older people who at this point in their life, you know, maybe they're not having as many exciting new experiences for a really amazing memory of their past. And they created something for them to smell and taste that took them back to a big moment. Mm. They actually 3D printed these tastes and smells on like a little Listerine strip type thing. So crazy what? research. Like, like, the taste of your favorite ice cream uh -oh. treat from a vendor. You know, like I'm thinking your about wedding, like the one couple, it was the food at their wedding. They were able to taste it. And or someone who had a curry tasting one, they took them back to that memory. Strawberries mm. from a day when they were young. And instantly people were vividly transported back to this memory. Instantly. Wow. And the researchers say this is a very powerful implication for creating happiness hacks. If you knew that in the past you had the best vacation, the best memory, you can instantly access that deep memory by smelling that smell, having that food. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I, I, my, my wheels are spinning because I'm thinking about my friend Pete Sheehan who made me a cup of tea once. Mm -hmm. And he was very particular about how he made it because yeah. he said only his mother has ever been able to make tea yeah. that tastes as good as this certain way. Yeah. And what I bet is I bet it brings him back to his childhood. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about this, because this research that you're talking about in terms of how taste and smell cues memory, yeah. this is specifically applied to very positive memories. Very positive, yes. And it's, it's, it's really kind of cool when you stop and think about the fact that you can, as you said, hack happiness by bringing very positive memories. I remember a really interesting story that has always stuck with me because we know that this is true yeah. based on trauma research, mm -hmm. that, that smell in particular can trigger a trauma response. And yeah. I, I believe it was in the book about uh, trauma that was written, you know, by a PhD medical doctor, 
talking about how trauma can immediately bring you back to that just terrible thing that happened. Mm -hmm. And so the researcher or the, the psychiatrist was talking about how he was treating a, a high school student yeah. who had had severe abuse. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this kid had gone from being like a really great student yeah. and doing well in class to almost flunking out of this math wow. class and being really disruptive in this math class. And it was very uncharacteristic of this kid to act this way, particularly in the math class. And so the therapist leaned in to try to figure out what the heck was going on. And what he discovered was this, that the math teacher had recently switched his cologne wow. and he was wearing cologne that was the same cologne that this kid's abuser had worn. Wow. And so just the math teacher coming up behind him wow, and the smell of that would trigger all oh, of the trauma, which of course made him agitated and untrusting and not wow. able to pay attention. The therapist got the math teacher to stop mm -hmm. wearing the cologne. Issue gone. Wow. And so we know based on research that this is true around trauma and negative yeah. experiences. I think it's really, really encouraging mm -hmm. to hear that smell conjures up positive experiences. In fact, I'm thinking about the fact that my grandmother used to wear a particular perfume. Mm. My father used to wear a particular cologne. And whenever mm -hmm. I smell it yeah. or smell traces of it, I immediately remember them. Yeah. Oh, this is so cool. Didn't you have a friend that did this with her wedding? Yeah, definitely. Intentionally? What happened? Yeah. So I'm going to be getting married this year. And I was talking to someone who just recently had their wedding. And I asked if she had any advice for me. Mm -hmm. And she said something that I have never heard before. She said, figure out what your smell is going to be at the altar of your wedding ceremony. Because that is a smell that for the rest of your life can transport you back to that moment. She said she picked out a very specific flower, mm -hmm. one of her favorites with her favorite smell, and did a massive arrangement right where she was going to be standing at the altar during her wedding ceremony. And she even sprayed something, a smell there, so that she said for the rest of her life, she can instantly transport into that memory. And she said to me, I highly recommend more than anything else that you do that, that and even not just for weddings, for any big moment of your life where you know that you're going to want to look back at this forever, create a signature scent, know what your smell is going to be, and you will go back to that forever. Speaking of smell, my cat Noodle just walked in. <laughs> <laughs> Noodle has been giving his signature scent to all yes. of your rugs lately. Yes. He, uh, he's been uh, really naughty. We've got this new puppy, as uh, you may know. And so uh, he has got a signature scent that he sprays around. <laughs> um, all right. I, I, you know, that's interesting because you think about marking rituals with a certain cake yeah. or a certain this or a champagne. But getting intentional around the type of flower or the perfume that you wear yeah. or those sorts of things. That's super cool. Yeah, definitely. And you can apply that right now about things going forward or about any positive memory that you want to remember. Okay, cool. What else? Okay, great. So we're getting near the end of these new studies. This one I thought was so much fun. It's a study from Indiana University, the University of Connecticut and Duke. And here's what it's about. It's about those mundane secrets that we hide from the closest people in our life. And that means, here's what the researchers define mundane secrets as. Hiding small online purchases, foods that you don't want your partner or friends to know that you eat, or things like watching a TV show ahead of your partner when you guys are doing it together and they don't know that you're sneaking ahead. And then you sit there and pretend that you haven't when you yeah. watch the episode. This the research I can't do that. I, I can sneak ahead, but when the episode comes on, I I can no longer sit there and pretend that I haven't seen it. That's the part yeah. where the gig <laughs> is up for me. So the researchers found that ninety percent of people have recently kept one of these everyday consumer behaviors a secret from a very close person in their life, a friend or their partner. And they would pour, you know what, my partner probably wouldn't care if they knew I watched ahead or I snuck a piece of cake, but they keep it a secret. 90% of us have these tiny little guilty secrets. Now, is this something we should do? Because everything Here's that you've recommended so far is additive. Yeah. 
So, yes, I am guilty of watching a show ahead and not telling Chris, but I always confess when we're sitting there. But they also did. Go ahead. Well, what's interesting is they actually found this is not a bad thing. It is okay to have your little guilty pleasures. You can hide little things from your partner. This is not about being dishonest. Listen to this. Tiny feelings of guilt, which don't hurt anybody, actually drives you to want to be better to your partner. Well, that makes (laughs) sense because guilt has two forms. Destructive, which is the guilt that you use against yourself where you just beat yourself up and make yourself feel bad. And then the guilt that is um, really productive because it motivates you to want to do better. And so are you saying that if, let's say, I'm trying to think of an example. I can give you an example that the study researchers found very common. Okay. What they found common is usually both partners do the same secret behavior and they hide it from the other. (laughs) And a very common one is around diet. Okay. Like both partners are vegetarians when they're together and they secretly eat meat, not together. What? They said this little secret might propel both partners to try to show up in a bigger way because they feel bad about this when they're both doing it most of the time. Watching a show ahead, Chris might be doing the same thing. It's very common that both people do this and kind of propels you guys to show up and invest more. And maybe it's not the worst thing in the world. Wow. Okay, so what's the takeaway? Don't feel guilty? The first takeaway is if you, like 90% of people, have made an impulsive online purchase that your partner doesn't know about, or you snuck a piece of cake, or you're watching ahead on the TV show, first off, don't beat yourself up about it, because the research shows they are probably doing it too. (laughs) (laughs) Like, your partner's probably doing this. That is killer. Yeah. Like, so don't feel bad about that Amazon box showing up and you quickly sneaking it into the back of your closet so that nobody knows that you, yet again, ordered another pair of pants. Yes. And this is not about betrayal. This is not about shopping addiction. This is about, they're calling it mundane things, Mm. things that do not affect your partner. It does not affect your partner that you went and had the extra piece of cake or that you went and ordered another t-shirt for yourself Mm -hmm. or ate the gluten amazing bread at the dinner with your friends but came home and ate the cardboard bread that was there yeah and I think also you know as we go into the new year a lot of people might do challenges with others I know you've talked about taking on a big fitness challenge with Chris Mm -hmm. and there might be times when you slip up and don't want to say and that is okay is what the researchers are saying as long as it doesn't hurt anyone it could be okay it sounds like it's more than okay. It yeah. sounds like it amplifies yeah. your want, you wanting to show up. This is so cool. Yeah. So, so far we've covered seven things, how important it is to add random acts of kindness, even just smiling at people, complimenting their nails, telling people that you appreciate them. Here's another one. Yeah. If I ever see somebody cleaning a public bathroom, I always stop and look in the eye and say, thank you so much for taking care of us. That's great. And most people are floored. Yeah. Uh, I love passive exercise. Sit down slowly in that chair once per day. Remember, everybody, we can can literally, I'm doing it now. It's a squat. That's what it is. You are going to get an inch above the chair and hold it for three seconds. Yes. That is a, that's a legit squat is what I'm doing because mm-hmm. my quads are fully engaged. Okay. Sit there, on down. sat down because now you can hear my, my voice yeah. shift because I'm yeah. not efforting anymore. That is backed by researchers from Australia, Japan, and Brazil. Just sit down slowly in your chair once a day. Yeah. Don't lift the weights, everybody. <laughs> Slowly lower them and you will be ripped. <laughs> uh, birds. Birds are something we're going to add in. Who knew? Yeah. I love this. Listen to a bird sound for up to eight hours of just a better day. Well, you're not saying listen to birds for eight hours. No. You're saying if you just listen to birds chirping for a second or two. Yeah. Eight hours of benefits. What? Okay. And then the fourth one is the mindfulness practice. That study out of Georgetown around bringing in some mindfulness into your day, like a gratitude journal, can cause as much reduction in anxiety as taking an antidepressant. And you know, we just did this episode right before this one? Yeah, last week. Oh, on Monday. 
Last Monday. Oh, a week ago. Yeah. We did this episode about doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And in it, I said to, I recommended that we set an alarm in our yeah. smartphones for 213 with a mm -hmm. little note that says, stop, yeah. take a breath, mm -hmm. do nothing. I even had a little song that I play yeah. when it happens. And that's an act of mindfulness. And one other thing that comes to mind, I know in Tim Ferriss's big book, yeah. Tools of Titans, he crunched the data on 250 interviews that he had done with like billionaires and world changers. Mm -hmm. And every single one of them had one habit that they all shared, right? Yeah. And it was a mindfulness practice. Yeah. So I know you know this, but when you start to understand how compelling the research is, not about, not only about how it changes the neural pathways in your brain, makes you a more positive and calm person, but to also know that in research studies, it has yeah. the same effect of dropping anxiety by 30% as prescription medication. It's That's huge. worth paying attention to. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, and then our study number five was do not rely on willpower for success, for accomplishment, and for getting important work done. Go on Do Not Disturb. Help someone have you stay accountable. Go into a quiet room just like those students who succeed on the SATs did. Awesome. Schedule in success. Don't just muscle through it. Yeah. What else we got? Oh, smell. I like this one. Yeah. Think about putting more positive smell associations into your life, whether yeah. it's bringing positive memories to mm -hmm. mind or it is creating positive experiences by getting intentional about the smell. Yeah. I love this. Yeah, definitely. And then we had our one sneaky <laughs> TV show watching, sneaky meat eating. So just giggle about it. Stop yeah. making yourself feel Stop bad. Stop making yourself bad because everyone else is doing it too. And there's one final change. Yeah. So this piece of research is something that researchers actually show is the easiest habit to make the largest impact in your life. And what is it? You can tell them what it is. It's being kind to yourself. This is so profound that I want to dedicate the next episode yeah. to just the research yeah. on how to be kinder to yourself because this recent study I know and the irony is of all the things that you could change in the coming year, the research is conclusive that learning how to be kind to yourself as a daily practice yeah. has the single biggest impact on your happiness, on your meaning, mm -hmm. on your sense of purpose. And the sad thing is, it is the one we practice the least. Yeah. And this is so important that the very next episode that we drop on the Mel Robbins podcast is going to go deep on the topic of being kinder to yourself, how to make it a habit, why it matters. And we are also going to do a bonus episode with it Great. where we're going to take people's questions about it because yes let's squat down on the chair let's listen to the birds let's structure our study time let's get the smells going people let's be mindful let's uh what were the other one what was the first one we did see i've already forgotten <laughs> the first one we did is around oh, the random kindness. act of kindness Amped up the kindness let's go and kindness towards self I want to talk to you about three simple steps that you can take to create powerful changes in your life. And I'm talking really big changes. Yes, the steps are simple, but simple over time creates amazing results. And simple is important because if it's simple, you can do it. As I already said, these are the three steps that led me to launching this podcast. They're the three steps that I use to help me start working on my marriage and making my mental health stronger. They're also the three steps that help me make the move from a very busy and stressful life outside of Boston, Massachusetts, where my husband Chris and I had raised our family for the last 26 years and make a major move and a major change to a simpler lifestyle by moving to a tiny town in southern Vermont. Now, using these three steps, I not only changed my life, I have reinvented every aspect of my life over the past two years. And today, 
I'm going to share those steps with you. I'm going to tell you the whole story. And I want to help you. I want to inspire and empower you to make the changes that you have been thinking about as you go about your day-to-day life. You know, speaking of life, I think about life as one long road trip. Your past right now is behind you. It's in the rearview mirror. And the future, it's right out that windshield. That's why the windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror, because we're not going backwards, people. We're not doing that to ourselves. We are going ahead. And you know what's in front of you? An open road. Every single birthday, I believe, is a mile marker on this road trip called life. It's a chance to pull over for a second and think about the open road ahead. Where do you want to go next? How fast do you want to go? How slow? Who do you want to have in the car with you? There's endless metaphors around this, and it helps me think about this major topic of reinvention and change. Now, I love birthdays. I'm sure you do, too, and I love them for so many reasons. Because every time you're celebrating a birthday, I mean, think about what you're actually celebrating. We're celebrating the fact that you're still here. We're celebrating your existence, that you're breathing, that you're alive. How cool is that? And you want to know what else we're celebrating when we celebrate your birthday? We're celebrating the possibility and magic that your life and the future and that next year holds for you. Now, there's one part of celebrating your birthday that I want you to really think about, okay? You know that moment when the cake comes out? Your mom or your dad or your spouse or your friends or the waiter, they bring out that cake and the candles are burning on top and everyone starts singing happy birthday to you. And then... They put the cake down, you look at the candles, you close your eyes, and you make a wish. And for just a moment, time stops. Have you ever noticed that as that cake gets closer to you and you start going inside and thinking about the wish that you're going to make, you don't even hear anybody singing anymore. You hear something inside yourself. You hear something deep from within. You close your eyes, you grab that wish, and you blow out those candles as if it's going to magically make that wish come true. And when you open your eyes, you are present to the wish. You feel excited for the year, and you can almost see all the new possibility that you could tap into in the year ahead. Well, researchers have a name for this exact moment. It's called the fresh start effect. When you make that birthday wish, you break from your past self, and this transformational window of time opens up. You think bigger. You feel hopeful and inspired. And there's some incredibly interesting research that explains why these moments are so powerful. I'm looking right now at a study from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania where they've studied the intrinsic motivational power of this fresh start effect. Researchers studied moments in our life where we feel motivated to make big changes, and birthdays are an example of that. It's as if a birthday hands you a blank slate, a clean page, a fresh start at a whole new year. And this feeling inside you ignites an intrinsic, motivational, aspirational force that's hardwired within you. It's this power to change. Now, you've experienced this fresh start effect at other times in your life, too. Just think about the new year, January 1st. Hello, fresh start effect. Now, January 1st is one of those moments where all of a sudden, last year ends. Boom, slam the door on that year, and something new opens up a whole new you, a clean slate, an open road. This is why, by the way, so many people start a diet on January 1st. Hello, Mel Robbins. So many people go to the gym for the first time on January 1st. It gives them a natural mental starting line to cross on a new leg of the journey called life. How cool is that? You also experience this fresh start motivation with every new semester in school, the start of a new sports season, You feel like this could be our year, right? That's the fresh start effect. The birth of a child, a breakup, a wedding, a death. These are all moments in time where something ends and something else begins. And it's not only happening in the physical space. 
It's happening in the psychological and spiritual space. That's why so much stirs inside you, according to the research. I just realized, you know, this fresh start effect, this is probably why I am addicted to buying new journals. Every time I get a new journal, I crack it open and I literally feel like a new mel is about to pour out on all those open, empty pages. This phenomenon is so powerful that researchers have even created a label to describe anything that triggers that fresh start motivation that stirs inside you, like your birthday, January 1st, that new journal, a new semester at school. These things are called temporal landmarks. Now, let me explain what a temporal landmark is. A temporal landmark is a date or an experience or a physical thing that marks the passing of time. January 1st, for example, is a date. It marks the end of one year and the beginning of a new year. And when the new year begins, you cross that starting line mentally to think about a whole new you. Your birthday is the exact same thing. It's another year, another mile on the road of your life. And this creates all kinds of new possibilities about the stretch of open road ahead. A new semester is an experience that's always brimming with excitement. New friends, new experiences, a chance to think differently about who you are and how you're going to show up and what you want. A breakup or a divorce. Now, that's a major temporal landmark because it not only marks time, it also impacts your identity, your life as a couple before, and now your life as you after the breakup. But here's what researchers have found that I think is fascinating about what happens to your psychology and motivation and thinking. Temporal landmarks not only mark the passing of time, they open up a whole new mental accounting period. Just like an accountant closes the books at the end of a fiscal year and opens up a fresh page to begin a whole new fiscal year, the event, whether it's January 1, the first of the month, a Monday, the end of a fiscal year, or making a wish on your birthday, this landmark creates a break from the past you. It separates you from the things that you feel are imperfect, and it silences all that judgment that you have about yourself. And here's the cool thing. When you shut that judge inside you down, you open the door to a whole new vision for yourself. It creates a break from your past self, the things that you feel are imperfect about you or your life, and the things that you judge yourself for. And here's what's really amazing. When you stop judging yourself and you stop focusing on what you think is wrong with your life, you open up the floodgates to what might be. So let's go back to that moment when you make a wish on your birthday. As soon as you see that cake coming with those candles burning, you go in. You stop hearing everyone singing. You close your eyes. Why? Because mentally, a new accounting period is opening up. You stop caring about the song and the people around you and what's happening outside of you. You tune into what you're feeling on the inside, in your heart, in your soul, what you dream about, that thing that's calling from you deep inside that normally you can't hear because you're so focused on all the stupid stuff that we all obsess about. No one even has to tell you to close your eyes. You see that cake coming. You know that you can make a wish. You just do it naturally. And when you go inward, you're disrupting the circuitry of your old thinking, your old judgments, and your past habits. For just a moment, you're escaping the old you. And then you make the wish, a wish for what could be, a wish for what will happen this year in the next year of your life. And the same thing happens when you sit down at the end of the year and you create resolutions, not the one you share with people at a party. I'm talking about the real ones that you write down in your journal. Here's another moment like that. You know that moment after a really painful breakup? This one takes a little bit of time because you basically need to cry and feel bad about yourself for about a month or two, you know? And then one morning, you wake up and you realize, oh my God, I'm happy that's over. I'm better off single. And you let go of the relationship 
and the version of you who was holding on to it for so long. And more importantly, in that moment of acceptance, you stop judging yourself and you realize you'll be okay. No, you'll be more than okay. You're going to be great because of this. And then you start to do the work to create a better life. These temporal landmarks are a big psychological deal because something really profound happens inside of you for a second. You snap out of all the stressful bullshit that's going on and the relentless self-criticism, and you have this mental freedom, this temporary break from your normal negative thinking, and you allow yourself to consider the bigger picture. You allow yourself to envision the future you. You tap into your deepest hopes, your wildest dreams, and your most exciting aspirations. You see a vision for a better life. You see that, yes, you deserve to be happy. And that's exactly what I want you and I to experience today on episode one of the Mel Robbins podcast. Let's hold each other's hand and sit side by side and imagine what might be possible in the next year of our lives if we let go of the past and we hold on to our dreams. That's the invitation I'm giving to you. Allow yourself to have a fresh start. You don't have to wait for your birthday or January 1st to change your life. You can turn the page on the past and start writing that new chapter today. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to share the three simple steps that you can use to create that powerful change that you've been wishing, wanting, or dreaming about. The fact is, change is possible, and you can't convince me otherwise. I know you might try, but I know that it's a fact. Change is possible. It's possible for everyone. And it's possible for you. Now, we're going to talk about this in depth, but the bottom line is, if you can imagine that new chapter, there is a way to make it happen. And I guarantee you, someone else on the planet has done it. I mean, there's about 8 billion people on this planet. Someone else has faced what you're going through right now. Someone else has built the company that you dream about building. Someone else has gone from where you are to where you envision yourself going. Someone else has improved their relationship healed their mental illness, and if someone else has done it, you can do it too. Start seeing people in the world around you as evidence of your own success being possible. I want you to start saying to yourself, if they can do it, then I can do it. Other people's success just proves that you're worthy of what you want, and more importantly, that you're capable of reverse engineering how they got there and doing the work to get it for yourself. Now, I get it. It might not happen the same way or look the same way. You might not be starting on the same starting line, and it might not take the same amount of time. But if you keep telling yourself, if they can do it, I can do it, you're going to change your mindset, and you're going to see that, yes, it's true. There is limitless success, love, money, and happiness. There's enough for everyone, and there's enough for you. And I want you to use me as an example from time to time. If Mel Robbins can do it, then I can do it. And honestly, I'm going to be looking to you for the same encouragement from time to time because I'm sure there are things you've accomplished or experienced that I haven't. So let's agree. We're going to encourage one another through this thing, okay? I know how to create massive change because I just did this in my own life. Over the past two years, I've completely reinvented myself and every aspect of my life. And look, I'm not being dramatic. It's a fact. It wasn't easy, but it was worth it. The Mel Robbins that you're hearing right now is not the Mel Robbins that I was just two years ago. Two years ago to this exact birthday. On the day that I turned 52, I did not wake up and feel like a million bucks. I did not see an open road. I saw a dead end. I was not kicking ass and taking names. Two years ago, when I turned 52, I was sucking wind. I woke up all alone. I felt lost and stuck and scared. Here's what was going on in my life. I had just been fired from my dream job. And look, I'd been fired from other jobs in the past when I was younger, but boy, at 52, that really stings. Then with COVID, the speaking and event business came to a halt. And as a small business owner, I'm responsible for the livelihood and health care of 15 families, including my own. So I started to panic. As the income dried up, I had no idea how I was going to continue to make payroll. 
And to add to that, I had people in my inner circle that betrayed me. They lied to me. They stole from me. So I just felt rocked because people that I trusted, that I had counted on, had violated that trust. That's what made me feel so damn alone. Plus, then college was canceled. Remember that? So we were all under the same roof with our three kids, two of whom were in college, and they were all anxious and angry and sad and grieving. I mean, it was like living with caged animals. I bet you felt a lot of these same things. And finally, my husband, Chris, he had just been diagnosed with long-term depression. I mean, talk about a shitstorm. I felt like absolutely everything was spiraling out of control. So here I am on my 52nd birthday with all this going on. And I wake up in the bunk room at my mother-in-law's house where we're quarantining. And I just started crying. The sadness that I had been trying to push down, it just poured out of me. And I instinctually picked up my phone and I just started filming how I felt. I figured someone out there on the internet would relate. And maybe, just maybe, they might even be able to give me some encouragement back. Now, when we come back after a short word from our sponsors, I'm going to play that video that I made on my 52nd birthday. And you're going to hear that sad lost Mel Robbins. And I want you to hear it because I want you to know I've been there and I've been there recently. And clearly, if I'm where I'm at now, kicking ass, taking names, going after my dreams, doing better than ever, I know how to bridge the gap from where you are to where you want to go. And later in the episode, I'm going to share those three steps with you that I took to make powerful changes and reinvent my whole life so that you can use those same proven, simple steps to make whatever changes you want in the next year of your life. You have natural intelligence inside of you. And that may sound all woo-woo. This is science. And we're going to unpack this all the time because I'm going to keep coming back to the fact that you have instincts, you have hard wiring, your gut is trying to tell you something. And one of the fastest ways to read that natural intelligence is to pay attention to your energy. You have felt what I'm talking about. You know when things are off. You know when you feel depleted. You know when you naturally click with somebody. That is data that matters because it's data that helps you make the changes, the small changes that improve your life. The fourth thing that you've clearly learned is that the best things in life are reciprocal. Even volunteering. Volunteering is a reciprocal act. You want to know why? When you volunteer and you volunteer your time, you volunteer your energy, you donate money, you always receive something in return, don't you? You feel this sense of meaning. You feel connected to something larger and more important than your day-to-day struggles. That is a reciprocal energy exchange. You donate money, you volunteer your time and effort and resources, you get something invaluable back. That's reciprocal. That's why it adds meaning. The best friendships, reciprocal. You, you pour in, they pour back. Same thing with your romantic relationships. And all you need to do is to think about that one person you chased, right? That you're constantly going after should I text now? Are there all the energy going at them? And yeah, maybe you got an orgasm back, but then mostly you got negativity because you're constantly insecure, constantly worried, no idea where you stood, always stressed out about it, thinking about it, distracted by it. That is not a reciprocal relationship. That is an obsession that's unhealthy for you. So there are things in life that are really hard, that take a lot of energy. Things that I hate doing. Things like exercise. I hate exercising. I hate getting out of bed. But once I push through that resistance, right? You learned all about this in the episode called Motivation is Garbage. Once you get the activation energy and you do the thing, what happens after you exercise? You get a reciprocal return of positive energy. You feel great about yourself. The same thing's true about my husband who doesn't drink right now. It takes a lot of effort. At least it did in the beginning. And it was really hard because he had been drinking for a long time. But even though it's hard, it's so worth it. Why? Because there is this reciprocal return. You start to feel so good about yourself. You sleep better at night. You're 
have clarity, have pride, you're, you're aligned with your values. And that values word is really important because when it becomes even more nuanced, your values is how you're going to create a return of energy in really hard situations. So I can give you two examples. Any one of you who is caring for an aging parent knows how difficult that is. Any one of you that has a child or a partner who is struggling with mental health issues knows how difficult that is. You also know that you are pouring your energy into caring for this person. And it can be very depleting because the person that is sick or the person that's struggling doesn't often give back what you're pouring in. It also may be physically demanding because you're working all the time, plus you're doing this at night, and so you are tired. It's a fact. So how in those situations do you create this exchange of energy? The secret is values. Tap into your values in order to create positive energy back and to help you rise above the day-to-day stresses that are temporary. Because the truth is, if you tap into your values, it makes you feel like an amazing human being, knowing that you are there for your mom. It makes you feel like a good person, knowing that you are a compassionate caregiver that is helping your child or your partner through a really difficult chapter. When you start to feel depleted, Remind yourself, lift your gaze, raise your gaze, and look out to the future and feel proud of yourself for acting in alignment with the kind of person you know yourself to be, even though it's hard. That's how you create a positive energy return for yourself in those situations where somebody either doesn't have it to give back or the situation itself is really physically demanding. I'll give you another example. Um, I have a friend that is going through a hard time and has been for a long time. And I continue to pour into this friendship, even though I don't get a lot back. Why? The reason why is I get a lot back knowing that if I were in this situation, I would want a friend of mine to stay around and pour into me. And that is what drives me. That creates that energy exchange. And so you have within you the ability to do things that feel hard, like exercising or stopping drinking or staying sober or changing your habits or making cold calls. You can do those things that feel difficult. And trust me, you're going to feel proud of yourself, which is why they return on the investment of effort. And you can do things that are draining, And I promise you, they will come back to you with energy because it makes you feel good about yourself. And I bet you can think of four or five things that you're doing right now that are hard that you're not even giving yourself credit for. You should be proud of yourself because you're a good person. You keep showing up. And that is something you need to celebrate. That's something that you need to feel energized about. And in those times when it gets really hard, remind yourself, this too shall pass. That what goes up also comes down just like when you're hiking a trail on a mountain, that this is a season of your life. And holding on, holding on to what doesn't serve you is going to drain you. It's going to kill off your happiness. But finding ways to bring energy back in in those situations that are aligned with your values and what you want, that's a power move. I want to start with... um, a particular post that you put on social media that went crazy viral and it really struck a nerve for me. And you posted this thing where you said, at 32 years old, I realized I was a child in an adult body. And this just hit deep for so many people. What did you mean? What I... Thank you um, for for calling out that post. Um, I think, you know, for a lot of us, that that can be really challenging um, to hear that about ourselves. And for me, if I'm speaking honestly, it was very challenging to come to that awareness. And what I met was mainly around my emotions and the way that I hadn't learned 
um, of course, in early childhood to, to tolerate, to navigate, to be able to process my emotions. And in many ways, and I use this language, I think this is the, the part that becomes difficult is in a lot of ways, I was very emotionally immature in the way that I handled the frustrations, the difficulties and the stresses of life. Because the reality for me, as I think is the case, which is I think why it resonates force with so many of us is that so few of us for many different reasons, which I'm sure we'll dive into many of which today, um, we didn't have those safe environments. We didn't have those emotionally attuned caregivers who themselves learned how to navigate their own emotions. So, I mean, needless to say, parenting is a, is a large, large task in and of itself. And, you know, when we don't have that safety and we don't have someone modeling, mirroring, attuning to us emotionally, what we do then appear is like a child in an adult body. I want to take a step back because for those of you who have not uh, read Dr. Nicole's New York Times number one bestselling book, which is a game changer, how to do the work, um, I, or you don't follow her online like millions and millions and millions of people do. Can you tell everybody what your life looked like at the age of 32? Because, you know, when you talk about emotional immaturity, it's not like you were running down the street naked, taking a baseball bat to the side of a wall, like kind of rambling gobbledygook. You were high functionally high functioning and successful. So we just give everybody like, what does life for Dr. Nicole at 32 look like when you have this realization that, holy shit, I can't process my emotions maturely. Yeah. And, and I'll be the first to say, I wasn't able to even admit that or even have that language um, for what was going on at the time. What I did know was that I had finally arrived or so I thought to the end of all of this, you know, achievement based to do list. Um, to speak to your point, I I wasn't, you know, kind of dysfunctional in the very traditional sense. I had, in a lot of ways, I had the successful, you know, life or at least appearance of life around me. Um, I was in a partnership, a committed partnership. I had a successful practice after achieving my PhD. Um, I was surrounded by, you know, a network of supportive individuals. I was living in the city that I chose to live in. Everything seemingly on the outside, right, was reflecting this idea that I should feel good or at least better than I was. So I, you know, I think as a lot of us do, my first feeling was a really low, a disempowered lack of fulfillment and shame. Um, because again, as I looked around, I kept almost telling myself, well, what is wrong with you, Nicole? Why aren't you, you know, feeling good about yourself? Why aren't you feeling fulfilled? Why aren't you feeling even connected to this life that you created? So not having the awareness of, of why I was struggling right alongside with, at that point, the clients that I had been working with week after week, month after month, um, I kept I wondering, you know, feeling as a disempowered then clinician in the room, what is wrong? Why are so many of us stuck? Those of us who even have access to supportive individuals like myself in a therapeutic environment, why is the report I'm getting week after week, not that I'm getting better, but that I'm getting more and more frustrated, more and more shameful, more and more stuck in these patterns. And for me, it really began with exploring, you know, what is keeping so many of us stuck? Um, and for me, I landed on the answer being all of the conditioning, oftentimes very stress-based, very trauma-based conditioning that, you know, was emblematic of the childhoods that most of us have grown up in that were creating habits and patterns that no matter how much insight, how much awareness that we had, were keeping us disconnected from ourselves, from our life and from our relationships. So as you are talking and somebody's listening intently going, wait a minute, is there a different way to experience life? <laughs> uh, you know, because adulthood, it's so familiar sounding that you check all the boxes. Ivy League degree, you know, you're practicing psychologist, you are uh, successful on the outside, you're surrounded by all these people, and you're having this internal crisis and disconnect where you're going, why am I not happy? What, what is wrong with me? What more could there be? How can I not figure this out? I am sure most everybody listening can relate to this. And so we're going to get into what you did. But if somebody is going, that's me, that's me right now, 
What is something, Dr. Nicole, that you want to tell them right now about what this means if you're experiencing this disconnection from what your life is like today and what you're feeling inside? You know, I speaking from the perspective of of having been that person, I mean, as I, you know, was entering my 30s, I convinced myself because I too saw similar, you know, complaints. I heard similar complaints and I almost gaslit myself in a lot of ways with this idea, like you're sharing, Mal, of this, this must be just what adulthood is. Um, this might just be the circumstances of the, you know, environments, very unnatural. I was living in a city myself that many of us are living. And it took me you know, becoming conscious again of the very real impact of these habits and patterns to create just that little bit of space. So what I want to offer to anyone who's resonating and has that embedded belief that this is just what life is about, or maybe, you know, a a more problematic belief, I think for ourselves is maybe this is just what my life is meant to be about. Maybe there's something inherently wrong with me, you know, that is translating to this lack of fulfillment, this overwhelming stress or whatever it might be for you. And so very much speaking from that person as well, I thought that something was just, you know, off about me. Um, I want to share, you know, the hope of creating that space of really, and you'll often hear me break down as far as I see the process of creating change into two major steps. And the first step I will always note is becoming conscious. And when we become conscious of how habitual, how patterned we are as individuals, then some of us can gift us with that little bit of space that then allows us to take that next step, which is beginning to make new choices outside of those old ingrained habits to then be able to experience ourselves differently. And I'm really being intentional with that because again, I think the best, you know, the best shifting of beliefs is when we ourselves begin to create change, begin to experience life differently. Many of us, I'm sure, have listened to motivational speakers who have said, oh, you can do this, you know, come on this side of, of life of change. And it really isn't, and again, speaking from my own experience of this, we don't believe it until we do it. But when mm. we be, do become conscious or as we begin to become conscious, we can gift ourselves with that space. Of course, does not happen overnight, but over time, we can may begin to then make new choices, relieving ourselves of that shame, that belief that this is just what life is all about and or this is what my life is all about. Well, this is one of the reasons why I love you so much, not only because you've made a huge difference in my life, and I'm going to try to take a highlighter and call out a couple of those things that you have said that were complete paradigm shifters for me and helped me achieve level up moments in my own healing. And so I want to um, just, un- I want to make sure everybody heard something, which is even the awareness that you feel stuck, even the awareness that something is off, even the awareness that this isn't working is great news. Because if I'm hearing you correctly, being frustrated or feeling discombobulated in your body about your life that is the consciousness that you're talking about? Yes, 100%. I mean, anything that we can attune to feeling, even the lack of, because I know for a lot of us, we feel numb. Um, For me, that was very much part of my journey um, is feeling apathetic, not actually feeling much of anything. Though to speak to your, you know, very beautiful celebration of that awareness, the moment we start to say, okay, you know, I don't feel anything or I feel so depressed or whatever it is that I do feel when I am able to see or witness. That's what consciousness means for me. And honestly acknowledge that that's the case for my circumstances, then we are actually beginning the process of creating change. Yeah, this is going on right now in real time in my life because we were just having dinner last night for my husband's birthday and our daughter um, has asked my husband, when do you feel most alive? What experiences make you feel most alive? And after Chris answered, I turned to her and I said, I've heard you say that word alive a number of times. Where is that coming from? And she said, well, it's because I don't feel that alive in my life right now. And I think when you have those insights, you're right to go, you know, I was celebratory because I'm trying to highlight the fact that most of us react to that insight that, holy shit, I don't don't feel excited by my life. 
I don't feel like myself. I don't feel alive. It's scary when you have that moment of consciousness. It's in incredibly scary, you know, feeling um, as many of us do when we're on that blind autopilot, especially if our autopilot is driven by a, a state of nervous system disconnection. I often connect many of the conversations, many of the habits and patterns that we're beginning to talk about now back to our physiological body. Um, and there actually is a state of shutdown that many of us, I found myself living in that created, and it wasn't to say like you were, we were going back to the beginning, right? I was still marching through life, you know, checking endless boxes of to-do list. It wasn't that I was apathetic sitting on a couch though. For some of us, that's how it presents. We don't feel motivated. We procrastinate. We actually can't get up and do much of anything though. Some of us are still able to continue to literally just live life going through the motions and our emotions are what makes us a human. So feeling very much, I talk about my spaceship that I was living on, the spaceship of disconnection that again began for me in childhood does create this feeling, this embodied existence of living like a robot. So when we rob ourselves of our emotional experience of life, we're robbing ourselves, in my opinion, of life itself. But again, as often is the case, there are reasons embedded in our mind and our body that have created that experience, even of that distance, that disconnect, that apathy, that lack of motivation, that procrastination, whatever it is, that isn't a reflection of who you really are, or what is meant for you in life, but again, is an adaptive coping mechanism, usually around your earliest environments or circumstances. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.